last video was about the book on the beach. It wasn't supposed to be a video just about the book. It was supposed to be a video about the book and the two movies. But I found a lot more to talk about than I thought I would. So that one is only about the book and this one is part two and this one is about the two movies. Or if I have the same problem again, this one is about the first of the two movies and then there'll be a third about the second. But I think, I think I can fit all, both the movies into this one. I'm not a movie person. I, I watch movies. I enjoy movies. But I don't look at them analytically. When I'm talking about a book, when I'm reading a book, I tend to look at features of it like the narratives and the author's plans for his characters and all the themes and how it's structured. I don't do that for movies. I just watch them. So even though this is a video about a movie, it's probably not a video about a movie the way most people are used to seeing because I really don't know how to analyse a movie. I'm not a visual person at all. What I'm doing is I'm comparing the movies, both the movies for On the Beach being the 1959 movie and the 2000 movie with the book and I'm just looking at what they did well, what they didn't as far as I'm concerned, what plot points they kept in and why they might have done it the way they did. That's, I guess, my burning question for this, why they did it the way they did, why they chose to make the changes that they made. Now, the 1959 On the Beach had a lot of famous actors, and in that way, it reminds me of the 2021 movie Don't Look Up, which I absolutely loved. Don't Look Up is one of my favourite movies ever. I have watched it so many times. I only watched it because of the subject matter. I do tend to like disaster movies and end of the world scenarios. I have always been fascinated by themes like that, but I love that movie. I have watched it heaps. I saw somebody talking about the 2000 version of On the Beach and saying how it actually had more impact for them because they didn't recognise a single actor, so it just seemed like normal everyday people. Somebody else said the same thing about Threads. The British movie Threads, how it just seemed like people that you might live next door to rather than actors because they didn't recognise them. Now, I have that experience with every movie ever. It's very rare for me to see an actor and think, oh, that's such and such. That doesn't happen to me. But I know it happens to everybody else and I know it's important. So there are some famous actors in this movie in 1959 and I think that was a draw card. But as I said, I just think it's really nice that 1959 had this end of the world scenario that was a very important movie full of famous actors. 2021 did the same thing with Don't Look Up. I'm going to assume that I don't need to introduce the characters again. I did say all this in my last video about the book, but the book is about five people and the movies are also about five people, the same five people. And already I'm seeing a difference because in the 1959 movie they have put... Dwight Towers as the main person, the first one they talk about, who is played by actor Gregory Peck. The book kind of presents Peter Holmes as the main character, not Dwight Towers. But in reality, I think Neville Shute became kind of fond of Dwight Towers' character. So we were in his presence a little bit, but to be honest, we were in Peter Holmes's head more than we were in Dwight Towers' presence. So who was the protagonist? In the book, I would still say it was Peter Holmes. But in the movie, in the 1959 movie, they're clearly placing Dwight Towers as the principal protagonist. That's all I need to say here. I'm going to go back to my original footage and have a look and see if I can use that. If not, the whole lot will be me today, dressed like this, with the wind outside. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's very windy today. We've got gale force winds. In fact, a little bit of my back porch has fallen down in it. But until the wind stops, I can't do anything about that. So I may as well be talking about On the Beach. So the 1959 movie On the Beach. This was a black and white movie directed by Stanley Kramer. It basically followed the plot of the book. The Northern Hemisphere has been nuked. Everyone up there is dead. Radiation is slowly creeping south in the winds. Life in the Southern Hemisphere has roughly nine months left, give or take some weeks. The book and the movie follow five connected people through their final days. The book has an overriding theme of personal responsibility. 
of not just sitting back and letting others make your decisions for you, because that's what brought humanity to an end. And that's the challenge still facing those who are left. Each of them is battling that same issue in different ways. So the main story. While Australia awaits the inevitable, a scientist develops a theory. Radiation will dissipate in the far north. If we could just get through that dense belt of radiation to the other side, maybe there's a chance after all. At the same time, a mysterious radio signal is intercepted. It's coming from a place that's supposed to be highly toxic. It's not making much sense, but there are words in it. It could be a child, it could be a sick person, but this also is a ray of hope. Australia doesn't really know what's going on. All they have are first-hand stories from fleeing ships and Morse code signals sent by communities that are one by one falling silent. Maybe, just maybe, the situation isn't as we think at all. But there's no petrol, so nobody can go and look. Luckily, there's a nuclear-powered submarine that escaped into Australian waters at the time of the war. A joint mission is planned. The American crew, with a couple of Australians on board, will head north into Radioactive Hill on a dangerous mission to discover the truth. This is an American movie made with an American audience in mind. That, I guess, presented challenges enough. The book is an interesting blend to begin with, being written by a British author living in Australia. There's a very British take on Australian characters, or maybe that made it easier. As far as the movie is concerned, they probably wanted to keep that Australian flavour, the courage and the warmth of Australians, without introducing a single element that might confuse the Americans. They did it by focusing on personal issues and making the American captain the main character was a good choice. Even Neville Shute ended up in Dwight's storyline more than the others because Dwight was active. Dwight actually did things. The cinematography is excellent in this movie. Great scenes, perfect lighting. It's a classy piece of cinema, visually very satisfying. Skillful acting, it's all highly professional. Two hours and 14 minutes of pure art, especially since it's black and white. Black and white always looks like art now, doesn't it? There are just a few things that rankle, and that's why I'm making this video. The trouble with making a movie from a book is that a book has so many facets, so many secondary characters, so many subplots. You can't put them all in a movie. The best you can do is take a few of them to maintain the essence, or maybe to improve on the essence. It's a choice. Some things have to go. But... You want the finished work to have some kind of impact, and this didn't. It's hard to judge after so many years. We're spoiled for dark storylines now. But I don't think that's it. This movie lacked spirit. Maybe I wouldn't think that if I hadn't read the book first. I don't know, but I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about each character in detail, but first a summary. There are five main ones. Peter Holmes... He's an Australian naval officer assigned as liaison to the submarine on its mission into radioactive waters. Mary Holmes, that's his wife, who was left at home. Dwight Towers, the American captain of the submarine. He's the main protagonist of the movie and arguably the main protagonist of the book too. Moira Davidson, friend of Peter and Mary's, a single girl taking the end of the world hard. I have a lot to say about Moira. Her character was radically changed in the movie. She's the love interest for Dwight Towers. And Julian Osborne. In the book, his name was John Osborne. He's an Australian scientist assigned to the submarine for the mission. His character was also radically changed. And I have a few things to say about that too. In the book, he was Moira's cousin in a convoluted way. In the movie, he and Moira are some kind of exes, thus giving us a love triangle. When we're looking at events, the movie followed the book almost beat for beat. Peter is assigned to the submarine mission and invites Dwight down for the weekend. Moira Davidson gets an invitation because Mary is afraid that Dwight will cry and she doesn't want that. Moira falls in love with Dwight. Julian gets assigned to the submarine. 
Peter has the iconic scene with the tablets and the three men leave for the north, leaving Mary and Moira at home. There's some time spent on the submarine, checking out the radio and the business of Swain. When they return, there's the Grand Prix and the fishing weekend right at the end. Dwight and Moira fail to get together and then come the deaths. What they left out was the cure. Some things I get. The farmer, for instance, and reducing Douglas Froud's role as much as they did. I don't like that they left out Moira's father. To me, he seemed like a fairly important character in the books. Although the movie does hang together without him, he was the voice of reason fairly often and had a perspective that we're now missing. I was actually debating when I did my video about the book whether he was actually the fifth character when it said it's following five characters. I was not quite sure. Was that fifth character Mary Holmes or was it Mr Davidson? But he's absent from the movie altogether. He has one little cameo scene. He's not introduced by name. He's just present towards the end when Moira is standing in a field and Dwight walks in, having come back from the submarine. She's standing there with her father. But that's the only time we see him in the movie. All of that, though, did work. Here's the biggest problem for me. They took out the latitudes. The creep of the radiation latitude by latitude gave the book a tension that the movie lacks. We know it's coming, it's five months away, but they don't do enough to show the passage of time. We don't know between scenes if it's been one day or one week. There's a very good scene at the start of the movie where Peter is looking at a calendar and it's January 1964. It's a movie edition that I love. The opening scenes are very, very good, but they fail to build on that. We needed to see every month torn off that calendar. Knowing at the start that there's now five months left, we needed to see that it's now February, that we've reached March. If they aren't going to use geographical clues like town names and latitudes, they needed to use time. But they didn't, and as a result, the movie lacked urgency. That was the biggest problem for me. At times, you could actually forget that radiation was coming. That makes sense for some of the characters, but not for us, the viewer. We're supposed to have that knowledge. We're learning about ourselves by seeing these people, how these people function in this situation. We're supposed to be frustrated at their thoughtlessness and sad and afraid for them. This was missing in the movie. And then there's Walsing Matilda. What was up with that? It was perfectly fine as an open song, even as a few notes here and there through it. Had they run out of money so they just picked a public domain, iconic Australian song and just spammed it everywhere? It's a sombre kind of song, yes, but it's not the only song to come out of Australia. And there was no need to destroy an otherwise quality film like that. Yeah, I hated it. I just hated that. Especially at the end. I guess they were going for insanity. Yes, they succeeded. If that's what they wanted, they succeeded. But not like that. The opening scenes in this movie, as I said before, are all very good. There are a couple of subtle changes like the calendar scene where Peter loses track of conversation when he notices that it's January 1964 and then he puts his hand out as if he can hide that fact from his wife. Not that he needs to, she's got walls like no other against reality, but it's another indication of his personality. The Holmeses now live in Frankston. I can see why, quite apart from Frankston being in roughly the right position. Full mouth sounds awfully like foul mouth when you say it, especially when you say it in an American accent. The streets are perfect with the bicycles and horses. Amazing that they could block off that part of town for the movie, but they clearly did, and it works. The scorpion is now the sawfish. I don't see why they made that change, but fair enough. If that's what they wanted to do, it makes no difference. None of the changes I've just mentioned really matter. They matter even less without the tension of approaching death. Because all those little things were poignant reminders that humans are so attached to their world that they can't adapt. There's no anarchy. People can't get petrol, but they still wear suits and carry briefcases and get to work on time. And do... what do they do? Are they preparing legal defences for a case that will never come to court? Are they recording radio plays that will never be broadcast? Are children being drilled in their times tables? 
so they can die knowing that 9 times 8 equals 73? That was the kind of question implied by the book. What really matters? What does it really mean to be human in our society? Are we sheeples? I don't feel that that was brought out in the movie at all. Character changes. The characters in Shoot's book portrayed five different attitudes, different reactions. Changing them is fine, as long as the change maintains that balance. So now I'm going to talk about our five characters in detail. Peter Holmes is the main protagonist of the book. It was once a common technique to have a passive main protagonist, someone who observed, and we the reader would observe along with them. This is the Watson character. That's definitely what Peter Holmes was. He wasn't in charge of anything, but he was present. Movie Peter is much the same. He's a good but not a great officer. He's responsible. He's obedient. He's punctual and well presented. There's just that one scene at the party early in the book where he's positively inept. A naval officer ought to be able to nip a hostile conversation in the bud, especially when he himself is the host. Peter was downright incompetent in that moment, which is a movie edition that once again I love. It matches his book personality. Peter drifts through life, not taking control of anything, just responding to stimuli. It's actually really hard to figure out his role in the submarine. As a narrative device, he worked as well as anyone else. But for the plot, why him? Why was he chosen when there were all those unemployed naval officers? Even in the book that jumped out at me, he was a married man with a baby at the end of the world. Why did they want to tear him away from the people who needed him? In the book it was money. He was poor. He wanted to give Mary and Jennifer the standard of living that they ought to have. But that only explains why he accepted the post, not why it was offered in the first place. The movie does a better job with that by switching Douglas Froud from being John Osborne's uncle to being Mary Holmes's. We, the viewer, can now assume that Froud pulled strings. He was a lieutenant general, the former leader of the Australian Navy. I don't think that was the rationale for the change, but it worked. It worked for that purpose as well. I don't have any more to say about Peter. He was pretty similar in the movie and the book. Mary Holmes, Peter's wife. She's the little woman engrossed in her garden and her baby. Mary is a fascinating character. This might take some explaining. As I read Neville Shute's book, she was the villain. She was everything that's wrong with the world. Mary had blind faith in humanity and survival and powers of the ether to make everything right. Even in these last days, she doesn't believe. She's absolutely certain that some trick will be pulled out of her hat at the last minute. She has faith in government. She has faith in nature itself. I don't know if she's religious. She doesn't go to church. It's more primeval than that. She's planting hedges and anticipating how they will look in 10 years' time. She's thinking about Jennifer's future education. She's homemaking, nesting like a bird. She was brought out perfectly in the movie. and. She is the one who closed her eyes and ears to the danger before the new king. She has a voice and she's willing to use it. And that's one thing the party did really well. That party scene in the movie showed that. She was able to put her foot down and say, don't you talk about things like that in my presence. I don't want to hear them. She has the ability to control her world. And she would have had the ability to stand up and make a political statement had she chosen to do so. But she didn't. Instead, she closed her eyes and ears to the danger. So despite having a voice and being willing to use it to defend herself and her family, she has too much blind faith to see the danger, too much faith in civilization, in society. People like Mary see that blind faith as a virtue in itself. If you trust without asking questions, how can anyone cause you harm? It's people like her who simply couldn't believe and therefore did not protest in time. And she's blinkered to the very end. The movie did a great job with Mary as well. She has the most astoundingly American Deep South accent that I've ever heard. Like Scarlett O'Hara, but that doesn't really bother me. She was excellent. Dwight Towers. Dwight is the staunch American. He's stoic, he understands the threat. 
Dwight in the book, in isolation, is scarcely a character at all. Most of what we see of him, what we learn about him, is in his interactions with others. He is the American captain of the nuclear-powered submarine, a married man with a wife and two children still back home in America. He's deep in the denial stage of grief and holding himself there because he'll break down if he moves out of it. In his mind, they're not dead. They're still back at home waiting. He talks of them as living people. He even buys presents for his children. And because of this, he can't get together with Moira because he's still married. In my book video, I discussed Dwight as an analogy for the American military, dutiful to the point of self-destruction. An analogy for all military, perhaps. It was the personification of the war machine. It shaded everything he did, all the rules of a lost age that he continued to follow, all the abidance to now meaningless institutions like marriage and not drinking alcohol on board ship. He's much that same character in this movie to almost the very end. Did Dwight and Moira consummate their relationship at the end of this movie? Apparently they did. I'm very obtuse about these things. The fade to black was too early for me to be sure, but even Neville Shute's family commented on that change, so that's what he did. And that invalidates the whole analogy. The war machine would never have humanised, even in the face of its own destruction. So while Dwight was pretty much the same character all the way through until that last scene, that scene changed everything. And the bit in the movie that is such a little bit, but actually to me it's a really big bit, is where Dwight accidentally calls Moira Sharon. He is so completely attached to Sharon that he doesn't make that mistake. He is enjoying Moira's company. She lightens his heart. She lifts his mood. He is so firmly attached to his wife that he never actually thinks of Moira as any kind of replacement. She never steps into that wife role for him. Dwight Towers was not really a hero. He was yet another part of the problem, someone else who devolved responsibility to others. But the movie needed a hero, so they changed that ending. I can see why Neville Shute wouldn't have liked it, but I can also see why the movie did this. The book was making a political statement. The movie was not. There are other things I can say about Dwight, but I'm going to put them in the section on Moira because they mostly relate to her. Another change is Julian Osborne in this. He is presented as something of a rake and an alcoholic, whereas in the book, I saw a review somewhere that referred to him, to John Osborne, that is, who is Julian in the book, as a perpetual geek. And I think that is much closer to the character that shoot actually put in the book i guess it spices him up to have julian osborne being like this but it actually makes him very much like moira it makes the two of them in a way it gives them a sort of a chemistry between them so i guess we end up with a kind of love triangle feel although in the book those two are cousins and i think they're deliberately cousins in the book so that this can't happen so that moira is completely free so there is no man in her life because otherwise if Dwight turned her down, she could turn to Julian slash John, whichever he is, but she can't turn to John because he's her cousin. So she really does have nobody in the book. Dwight is the only one she's got. If she can't have him, if he won't have her, which he won't because he's married to Sharon, then she really is having to deal with it all entirely on her own. So I wonder why this movie changed his character so much. I mean, he is an interesting character, this Julian Osborne. He's quite intriguing. And I guess this movie did need a bit more sparking up. If they weren't going to keep Moira in her original personality where she was the angsty, angry one, she was the one that had all the life, really. She is so full of life that she's really struggling with the concept of losing it. They've given that to Julian Osborne in this movie. In my last video, I mentioned the 1950s distrust of scientists and how... I felt that Shoot humanised John Osborne because he was a scientist and he wanted him to be sympathetic to the readers. John Osborne in the book was a well-rounded character with very comprehensible motivations. This movie has undone that. In this era, people had a massive distrust of scientists. They hated them. Scientists were always the evil people, which is why I felt Shoot had put so much time into the personality of John Osborne. But in this movie, they've gone back to the old idea. The comment early on at the naval meeting about 
government and long-haired scientists. That's a sentiment that you would never have seen in the book. In this movie, scientists are people you can't trust. Scientists are not good people. Scientists are people with their head in the clouds who are utterly out of touch with reality. Scientists have to be kept in their place. In this movie, the Admiral is feeling disempowered by government and scientists not telling them what was going on. The book has a similar conflict, but it's Dwight Towers who feels disempowered, who doesn't know what's going on because the Americans are outside the chain of command. There's no rampant posturing going on this close to doomsday. Inefficiency, yes. But nobody's trying to make power plays when the world is coming to an end, which is what seems to be implied here in the movie. The inevitable result here is that we, the audience, are set against scientists, if not against science. And that means John Osborne, now called Julian Osborne, is cast as an enemy within the ranks, which I don't like because I like John Osborne. And I feel like there was enough conflict without making him another enemy. But... I know that's what movies like to do. They want to put a human face on everything in there. So they had to pick somebody to be the human face of the enemy. They have made it John Osborne, a.k.a. Julian Osborne. The mistake about the CSIRO jumps out at me. They called it CSIR. I know that's a little thing. It's just a scripting thing, an error easily made. But this movie is so professional in so many ways. They rarely put a foot wrong in the whole thing, and yet that one was left. Which is kind of ironic since they're now portraying the scientists as the enemy, and they can't even get the name of the scientific organisation correct. It particularly leaped out at me since it said in an authoritative voice by Dwight, giving instructions to his men. The scene where Julian Osborne is talking to Moira about the car, that scene happens between John Osborne and Peter Holmes in the book. And he bought it because it runs on ether alcohol. It's not some kind of midlife crisis. He didn't buy it in order to kill himself. That certainly becomes the objective towards the end. That's certainly something he starts thinking about as he's driving it around and it's really fast. But in a way, the car seems to me in the book, it becomes like his wife. That is his companion. That is the thing that means the most to him. That is where he chooses to spend his time. When he's lonely, he goes to the car. When he's sad, he goes to the car. And at the end, he chooses to stay with the car. So this scene, it does cut through a lot of stuff because down the track, that is how it goes. He is entering the Grand Prix thinking if he's going to die, he'll die doing something he loves. He'd prefer that to radiation sickness. But at this point, when he's just bought the car and he's just starting to get out on the road, it's more getting in touch with himself and who he is and how brave he really is inside. There's a conversation between Julian and Moira in the movie where they say he was in love with her and she turned him down. I hate it. I have so much time for John in the book. He's coming alive. He's doing all the things he wanted to do. If there's ever a streak of optimism in the book, it's him. He's going to go out as his actual true self, not stuck in the role he was pushed into by society. That's his part in the story. He can move forward. The only one of the lot of them who does. John Osborne has spirit. He is the truest character in the whole thing and I don't like the way they changed him for the movie. Okay, I need to talk about Moira Davidson. This is a movie, and of course they're going to make adjustments to characters to better suit the format, to present somebody who they think their audiences are going to like more. I get that. But with Moira, they removed her completely and replaced her with a very different person. And I don't see why. It was obviously a successful move. A lot of people bought into the Dwight Moira romance. If I hadn't read the book, I probably would too. I'd just go away thinking the romance was okay, although nothing special. But my favourite characters in the book were John Osborne and Moira Davidson. Both of them were changed beyond recognition. I don't know, maybe they were the most Australian characters or the most British. Maybe that's why they were changed. Was it because they were the most intelligent? I said in the last video that I didn't understand Moira's place in the book. I still don't. But that's a different thing to not understanding Moira. I think that I understand Moira very well. I related strongly to Moira. And she was one of the things I particularly wanted to see when I came to the movies. I wish to express my disappointment. 
which is not to say that I'm unhappy with Ava Gardner, who played Moira. Ava Gardner is a talented actress and she did a brilliant job portraying the character that she portrayed, who was not Moira, but was in Moira's place. The Moira Davidson in the movie was was just different. For a start, they've made her someone who sleeps around. I didn't see her that way. She was drinking a lot. She was drinking a lot because she was angry, because she understood what was coming, because she couldn't pretend like the people around her were pretending. And her brain was just too active. So she was drinking a lot. She used to drink a lot of gin, but it was making her sick. So now she's drinking a lot of brandy and she's drinking in the mornings and she's going to parties. Was it implied that she's sleeping around? I didn't get that at all. It just seemed to me that she was keeping her brain numb. She was running. She was running from the truth. That's how she was dealing with it. This idea that she's someone who slept around a lot and hasn't slept in her own bed for three months, I think that's a change of character. That said, the book actually leaves it open to our interpretation. There's a conversation right at the beginning between Peter and Mary where they're talking about how to occupy Dwight when he comes down to the party. Peter is suggesting that she does sleep with men and Mary is saying she's not like that. So they're probably right because of the two of them, Peter is the more reliable character. He is the one who's more in touch with reality whereas Mary lives in a total fantasy world. So maybe she does sleep around and she does do the thing with her bra in the boat. That's true. I'm still not convinced that she's sleeping around. Not that it matters in the scheme of things. I was particularly interested to see what relation Moira was to them, like whether she was a friend or a family member. It looks to me like she's a friend. There's no mention of her being related. But there is a mention of them already knowing Julian. Moira from the book, I mean, apart from the fact that she's one of the very few people who are described physically and she is described as being a girl with straight blonde hair, whereas... This woman, she's got to be 30 at least. She's definitely older and she's way more, um, she's kind of very self-assured. And Moira wasn't. Moira was edgy. I think that's the difference. Moira in the book is edgy, whereas Ava Gardner here, Moira here in this 1959 movie, is very together and very flirty and a bit older. It's fine. As I said, I didn't really get what Moira was supposed to represent. So I think it's fair enough. She may as well be Ava Gardner. But I think one thing about her was she's meant to be quite innocent, even though she's drinking a lot. She's struggling with life. She's struggling with the fact that life is nearly over. She is innocent and she's been dealt a really bad blow in life because she never got to do anything. She's younger than Mary Holmes. And she never got to get married. She never got to have a husband and a child. She never actually fulfilled a single dream. And everything's been taken from her before she could even begin. Moira in the 1959 movie is older and together and doesn't seem angry. She does not seem angry at all. She seems like she's kind of just enjoying her life kicking on and it doesn't really matter. Whereas Moira in the book was angsty and angry and deeply troubled. They've dumbed her down. 1959 movie has dumbed down Moira Davidson. She was a bright spark. She had her head straight and she knew just what was going on. She was mad about the fact that the radiation wasn't coming down straight away. Like, why do we have to wait? The questions she's asking in the movie are the same ones as she's asking in the book. I wish we were, she said bitterly. It's like waiting to be hung. Maybe it is, and this is Towers talking. Or maybe it's a period of grace. There was a little silence after he said that. Why is it taking so long, Dwight? She asked at last. Why can't the wind blow straight and get it over? So the words are there, but the delivery is very different. It is interesting to see what a difference that can make. And then he goes into his explanation of the pressure equator and wind patterns and everything And after all that, in the book, Moira says the line that was actually on the back in the blurb. I didn't read out that bit. I won't take it, Moira said vehemently. It's not fair. Why should we have to die? Because other countries nine or 10,000 miles away from Australia wanted to have a war. It's so bloody unfair. That Moira, that angry Moira, who is full of fire, is 
not this character. And I'll stop going on about that now because really she's a fine character, this Ava Gardner Moira, just not the same one. Okay, I lied. I do need to talk about Moira a bit more because she's talking about how she's not bright, how she failed algebra twice, how the only thing she was good at was geography. And that's sort of in there because she wanted to travel. This is a complete and direct contradiction to the Moira in the book who was very bright, who had graduated from the University of Melbourne with a degree in history with honours. In the 1950s, you really had to be bright to get into uni and it was something that not many women did. So the fact that she went through uni and graduated with honours, she was definitely a woman of higher than average intelligence. And the reason I'm ranting about that here is because she was the one character that I felt I could really relate to in the book. I enjoyed the scenes that had her in them. I enjoyed her attitude. Even in the later days when she'd fallen in love with Dwight, she still handled everything in the same way, with the same attitude. She had so much to her. And I'm a little bit sorry that the movie actually took that character out. The one character that I like the most in the book has been replaced with someone else. I wasn't going to talk about this visit to the scorpion scene, but I think I will because it's quite different from the book. Even when I read it in the book, I actually was surprised that it was allowed. In the book, Moira comes up to Melbourne and meets Dwight. She comes to meet Dwight because he has promised to give her a tour of the scorpion and she's dressed all in white, which are navy colours. She's wearing a pleated skirt, a white blouse with coloured thread embroidery vaguely Norwegian in style and white shoes. Even when he first meets her, Dwight is a bit concerned about her outfit and that's because she's dressed all in white and he's going to show her over a ship which has a lot of grease and oil and stuff like that in it. So that's bound to get on her white dress and leave a mark. She's come up to town on the train, she meets him and the plan is that they will eat a meal in the HMAS Sydney. Moira balks at it when she realises that she won't be allowed to drink. There's no alcohol. So she says, how about we go to a hotel instead? She said restlessly, I want to drink hard liquor, as you call it, before lunch. I've got a mouth like the bottom of the parrot's cage. There must be a hotel here somewhere. Buy me a drink before we go on board. And after a little while... He managed to detach her from the hotel after her second double brandy and took her into the dockyard and to Sydney, hoping that she would behave herself in front of his officers. But he need have had no fears. She was demure and courteous to all the Americans. Only to Osborne did she reveal her true self. All of which shows the true Moira. Moira was equal to anything anything except for the knowledge of certain death. Even though she was a heavy drinking person, she was still in charge. The drinking was her choice. The drinking was not in charge of her. And she could still change her behaviour to whatever was actually required. Which is another bit of Moira that I so far feel hasn't come out in this movie. She's a real mix. Neville Shute says she showed her true self when she was with Osborne, who was her relative. Is that Moira? Is that her true self? I don't think so. That may have been Chute's intention at the time he wrote that. But there's another paragraph in this chapter just a little further along that I think really encapsulates Moira. It's an excellent piece of writing. They've left the pub. Moira has had her two double brandies. Dwight had trouble getting her away and he's taken her back to the ship. He's a bit nervous about how she's going to behave. When he offered her a drink, she chose an orange aid. She made an attractive picture in the wardroom of Sydney that morning, drinking with the Americans, standing beneath the portrait of the Queen. That is Moira, and this is after she's had the two double brandies. She's still in control. She's still poised and graceful and not putting a foot wrong in society. I probably should have spoken about this in the book video, but I didn't. It's only now that we're watching the movie and I'm looking for the bits that I really liked in the book and not finding them. This is one of those bits. This is Moira to a T. 
She's adaptable. She's talented. She doesn't know where she belongs. And because of that, she can belong anywhere at this point. She's as much American as she is British. She is whatever she needs to be. I think this is the moment when Dwight started seeing her differently too. Dwight being the upright American naval officer that he is, married man that he is, at no point does he seriously believe that he can get together with Moira. But at this point, he actually looks at her differently. This is the first moment that he finds her attractive. He treated her with respect before, but only in the way that he treats everybody with respect. It's a polite, distant sort of respect. From this moment, when they're drinking orange aid in the wardroom of Sydney, this is when it becomes clear that these two could get together. And this being such an important moment, such an important scene in the whole story, I feel like the movie lets itself down not including it. And then she's taken to Dwight's cabin because it's the only place he can think of for her to get changed. While she's in there on her own getting changed, she sees the pictures of his children, which is obviously the purpose for that scene. So she can see his children so that they can become real to her. And the rest of that scene in the movie is pretty much as it is in the book. I wanted to talk about that because of the way it's done, where she just wanders up to the wharf, all the men are just watching her. This Moira likes being the centre of attention. She asks to be taken to the captain and one of the sailors just takes her to the captain's private cabin. And maybe I'm being a bit critical there, but I feel like anybody who has been in any kind of regimented sort of workplace would probably break out in a cold sweat at that. I'm sure that wouldn't be allowed. So that scene destroyed the emotion of the movie for me a little, which is why I'm mentioning it. And it also doesn't fit with the Moira in the book, who only came through there because she'd arranged it specifically with Dwight while he was down staying with the Holmeses. And she was extremely well behaved, extremely quiet, not putting a foot wrong when she's in good society. I have to comment on this scene between Dwight and Moira. The dance is fine. I have no issues with that. Works in the movie. It was kind of in the book. It's the conversation that follows that bothers me a little. It does make sense for the Moira in this movie. So I don't want to be too critical of it because she is a different character and that's fine. That works for the movie. I keep saying that, but it does. I just feel a little bit I guess embarrassed for her when she's throwing herself at him so hard and she doesn't seem to be able to read his moods whereas the book Moira was much better at recognising where his thoughts were, where he was at in his head. Book Moira would never have tried something like that, would never have said, why don't you just pretend I'm your wife? Because Book Moira knew that that wouldn't work. Book Moira knew that Sharon was still very much living to this man. It wasn't a matter of he needed somebody there to pretend that she was alive. Book Moira knew that she was still alive that it would break him to admit that she was dead. That scene that I didn't like was to me somewhat rectified by the train station scene where Dwight follows Moira and tells her, tries to explain his perspective. That was a great scene. That is one thing that this movie did really well. The acting in that, the setting, everything worked perfectly. That scene was fantastic. And Moira then getting on the train and going, I thought that worked really well too. That was a very gripping scene. And now we get to the one that I hate, which is Moira getting absolutely plastered and going around to see Julian. I hate every aspect of it. This Moira in the movie is using alcohol as a crutch. Book Moira was using alcohol to numb her mind, but it was never her crutch. It was never her turn to, to deal with her problems. Book Moira used alcohol as an anaesthetic and used parties as an anaesthetic and kept herself busy and kept herself on the mood. Whereas movie Moira can't handle her emotions and is turning to alcohol when anything goes wrong in her life. So here she is, really drunk and she goes around to Julian because movie Myra also needs a man which is something I don't like in a movie but I can absolutely forgive that in a movie from 1959. This was the era when that was the big thing, that was what people wanted, that was what women would go to see this movie and sympathise with Moira. So it's fitting, it's appropriate for a movie of this era to have that. All the same, I don't like it and I also don't like it because while it's only really a cousinship by marriage. They were cousins in the book. 
that's how I met them first. And to have them now, people who were in a relationship, that's a bit of a challenge to somebody who just came to this from the book. But here he is completing the love triangle. It's fine, but a character that I admired so much in the book, it's hard to see her brought to this particular low. The best part of this movie which is also the best part in the book, is when they're in the submarine and they go off on their assignments. They make two trips in the book. I think it's all combined in the one, either that or they just forget about the first one because in the book they do the trip up the coast and just figure out how far the radiation has come down in Australia and then they come back and then they go off again and do the big trip up testing Jorgensen's theory to see if there is less radiation way up north and looking for the radio signal. That's a different journey to the one where they go to Cairns. But they only make the one in this, which is fair enough. That's, I think, the best way to handle it. There's not enough time in a movie for two different journeys. All the submarine bits, I think they do really well. They really have turned Julian into the same character as Moira. He's sitting here saying to Peter on the submarine, what have you got to complain about? You've got everything. You've got a wife. You've got a child. You've got a house. You've got everything. You've had everything. How can you complain to me that things aren't good? Which is exactly what Moira said to Mary. So, yeah, they're just the male and female version of the same character now. Whereas John in the book, he's not like that at all. He's always happy to listen. He's never quite understanding because he doesn't seem to see things that way. But he's always got something to say, and he's always got something quite rational to say. Not comfortable. It's something uncomfortable, but it is something rational. It's something that makes perfect sense in whatever situation it is. I mean, watching this movie now, I'm just here thinking, why didn't Julian and Moira get together? There's more chemistry there. They're so much more the same sort of person. They understand each other. They're going through the same things. What on earth? stop them getting together are we meant to assume that julian is an alcoholic because moira did say something earlier about how he would just drink on the he would just drink the whole time on the submarine so maybe that's it maybe he's supposed to be an alcoholic but what we see of him like he's not drinking now and he wasn't before he was just doing all this stuff on the ferrari so he doesn't come across that way i'm not sure i'm not sure who he is in this movie then we've got these scenes of San Francisco. They did do a great job of looking on shore. The bit where Swain sees his hometown and then sneaks out and goes off, that was as good a bit in the movie as it was in the book, except for that last bit where they're talking to him from the submarine and it just comes across really weirdly. There's something odd about the way they've done the sound. Like 1959, what am I expecting? It was really well done. It's not a real complaint, but it just comes across as sort of comedic when just at the moment when it absolutely shouldn't. But apart from that, it's quite a powerful scene. So this bit where Sunderstrom goes to find the radio, that's a great bit. Great bit in the book, great bit in the movie. I found this a brilliantly tense scene in the book and in this movie. He actually has two hours of air in his cylinders and he wants him back in an hour and a half. In this movie, they've shortened it from an hour and a half to an hour. It's always tense. Every time you hear that blast, I did feel it was a great scene. You know he's got this time limit. You know he's got a lot to do. He's out there utterly unprotected. Fantastic scene. It's an impressive place he goes to as well. This is another bit that I'm glad to have the visualisation. They said it was a refinery in the book. I think it was a refinery, but that didn't really mean much to me until I saw it on this, like how vast it was, what a big place he's gone to. They don't do anything else with it, though. In the book, once he's gone and found the signal and he sent his message from there, and what he did was he actually sent a message back to Melbourne, which was a nice touch. They didn't do that in this movie I don't think it doesn't look like they did but he then looked around he sat there he read some of a newspaper he found there and I just thought that was like if it had been me I would have just gone back and he's just there thinking oh what can I do how can I fill in my time what can I see that I haven't seen so he just caught up on some of the details that he'd missed the three concluding instalments of the serial, The Lady and the Lumberjack. So he just sat down to read. Now, I couldn't do that because 
I mean, I don't know if I'd have the issue in that situation if I'm sitting there all suited up with an oxygen tank that's likely to run out in the middle of a place that's totally radioactive where everybody is dead. I might not be able to, but often when I read, I completely switch off from everything around me. And so when he did this, when he decides he's going to sit down and read the last three instalments of The Lady and the Lumberjack, it just sent my anxiety sky high. I just thought, no, no, don't do that. That is a dangerous thing to do. What if you lose track of time? What if anything could happen? It's a horrible thought. But he was all right. The siren blew five blasts and roused him before he was halfway through the first instalment. So he didn't even get to the end of the first one, but it roused him and he left. Then he was heading back. He's only got 15 minutes left at this point. And so he leaves the building, he's heading back, and this is when he sees, in the book, he sees this party. The building had a deep veranda facing the view. He saw now that there was a party going on there. Five men in khaki gabardine sat with two women in easy chairs around a table. In the light breeze, he saw the flutter of a summer frock. On the table, there were highball and old-fashioned glasses. For a moment, he was deceived and went quickly closer. Then he stopped in horror, for the party had been going on for over a year. I mean, that's a great scene. And so that sort of broke him out of the fuge that he was kind of in and he turned back and he decided no he just wants to go and find living people which is really good because the way he was just meandering all over the place when we're so close to time I was that just had me on the edge of my seat actually they skipped all that in this movie in fact they skipped everything else the very next scene they're back in Melbourne and he's come to visit Moira and she runs to meet him. So it's 18 days later that the scorpion surfaced in clean air in latitude 31 degrees south near Norfolk Island. So at that point, 31 latitude was still fine. But earlier on, when they set off, they could surface at 20 latitude or at 22 latitude. So now it's 31 latitude they've got to get to to be safe, which is a sign that the radiation is creeping down and that yet again that is absent in this movie even though they went up north they saw the radiation and now they're back we don't really get any sense that it's coming closer even they don't give any sense that it's closer than when they went up so then we've got the car race in the book he was kind of like he's still fumbling his way and he says that himself I don't really know how to drive I've never done this before he's doing pretty well It's gotten a long way for someone who doesn't know, but he's kind of got that far because some of the people who were better than him, who were ahead of him, actually just crashed and burned. But there's something to that. There's something to being determined. It was a deserved win, I think, given the circumstances. In this movie, he's won outright, and you don't really see any of the challenges that he faced in the book. It takes the whole chapter to talk about the race and the curves, like the various turns and what happens, who the other drivers are and what happens to them and afterwards when he's remembering them. Then we move into the fishing season issue, which happened in the book a little differently. In the movie, Dwight knows that somebody brought pressure to bear to have the season moved up. In the book, it is Moira who does that, but I don't think it ever comes out that she's done it. It just looks like government have decided to move it two weeks earlier, given that we're getting close. I guess it's implied in the movie, but by this point, radiation had reached Sydney. It was even moving south of Sydney. It was heading towards Canberra. So we're getting very close, and if you've read the book, at this point in the movie, you know how close we're getting. But at this point in the movie, if you haven't read the book, then I don't think you realise. You know it's coming close. You kind of know it, but you don't have that feeling of, like in the book, you know. You know how close it is. Everybody knows how close it is. Everybody knows now that the miracle isn't going to happen. Everyone is starting to be aware, starting to be afraid These are the last days. Now, in the book, at this point, they're starting to bring out, like, cars are coming back on the road because although they'd run out of fuel, a lot of people actually had, like, a little can of fuel that they were keeping for an emergency so that, you know, if if their spouse had a heart attack, they could toss them in the car and drive them into hospital. Now they're 
thinking, well, it's pointless. If we don't use it now, we'll never get to use it. So in the movie, we sort of get that, but not as clearly. Not that we necessarily need to. It's just something I'm noticing. And then we get the fishing scene. This utterly nonsensical waltzing Matilda singing scene. I don't understand what it's there for. I don't know if people actually ever sang that song in that way. I don't suppose the people making this movie would know if they did. They have picked Walsing Matilda to be iconically Australian. And that's sort of fair enough. And it is a song involving a death. And it is a song involving a waterhole. So I guess it makes sense to sing it there. But at a bit that ought to be really poignant I feel like it ought to be really poignant and it can't be with this all these people singing this mindless song it's a good song with a good story to it but not like this they're not singing the whole thing they're just singing this the refrain over and over again and turning it into a kind of a drinking song it goes on forever it goes on they repeat it over and over and over again Again. So because in the book we've been following the latitudes and we know what's going on in the different towns a little more, it's not anything like a surprise when radiation actually hits Melbourne. And it's not exactly presented as a surprise. Like, they knew it was coming, so they do act as if this is just what we expect. But as the viewer, I feel like it probably is more of a surprise, except that we know it's near the end of the movie, so we know that it's going to happen about now. But I wish there'd been a bit more build-up for that in the movie, kind of because that's the bit that I enjoyed the most. And I shouldn't say enjoy, because it is not a movie to be enjoyed. It was a scary thing. There was a scary thing in the 80s when everybody was worried about this. It is one of those things that you just don't carry on and live your life because of. And it was a very real thing. But viewing it now, in the future, looking back at it, at the movie where I am consuming it as a product, I kind of wish that had been in there. I was drawn to that. Did Dwight and Moira sleep together? I hadn't really taken it as such because I read the book and in the book they don't at any point because Dwight is firmly married to Sharon all the way through. Sharon is a much more real character in the book than she seems to be in the movie. And it fades to black, so... To me, it wasn't clear. Like, unless they wake up in the same bed in the morning, it's still not clear to me. But apparently they did. Neville Shoot wasn't happy about it. And I can see why not, because Dwight Towers was a certain type of character and he was representing that intractability of the military at the time. So that was undermined. This video has taken me days. I should have known. But we're now at the wrap-up stage. We're up to the deaths. There aren't too many changes between the book and the movie at this point, and the little changes that there are maintain the theme. So there's not really much to say there. We spend a bit of time with each one. Peter, the earlier events where he gets tablets and has to talk with Mary in the book, they're not the real thing. He is not authorised to get the real thing. So... He is given dummy tablets just so he can show her what they look like. And now, at this stage, he gets the real thing. Everyone is starting to get sick around them. Everybody is just finalising their lives, doing their last things. I don't remember how he does it in the end. I know there is a giant lineup. That lineup might happen in the book. It's not described, if so. At this point, they're all sick. Jennifer got sick first, but Mary was still hoping it was just a regular bug, not terrible thing but then Peter gets sick and then Mary gets sick there is a bit of talk in there about how sometimes you get radiation sickness and you seem to recover and then you come down with it again but even if you seem to recover it's not real recovery and I can see now when you get to the end of the book Peter gets sick, he realises what it is, but he does have this rallying recovery stage, which is very handy because then he can go and get the tablets and take them back to his family. 
I do think it was a good call to avoid that little mess of happenings in the movie. So he just goes to get the tablets. He goes back home. They lie on the bed and that's it for Peter and Mary and baby Jennifer. There's the sickness of the first mate, which is made a bigger deal in the movie than it is in the book. I think that was a good idea too. He would have been the person closest to Dwight through the whole thing from the time of the war, from before the time of the bombs. So he probably ought to have been a bigger part in the book all the way through. And it made a great deal of sense that Dwight was most shaken by his sickness and death at the end. We see John Osborne collecting his tablets from a chemist where the chemist is already sick, the store is empty, it's, the door is open and the chemist has just placed all the tablets in a box on the counter so John Osborne just gets what he needs. I kind of liked the way the book handled that. We were in his head quite a bit in the last days, more in John's head than the others I think. John had a mother and his mother had a little dog and when his mother got sick he fetched her a tablet he fetched himself a tablet and when she had taken her tablet and died John put the little dog down because that was something that was worrying his mum hugely so the dog and the mum and then he laid the body of the little dog on his mum's bed next to her because that was her special pet the two of them were very close and I thought that was a really nice way to do it and then John is getting sick like he is sick at the end this is Julian John is Julian and he goes to visit his uncle at the pastoral club and his uncle's still kicking on. Like, he's a rampant alcoholic. He's still trying to get through all this port in the club. But the radiation isn't affecting him as much because of the alcohol in his body. It's not going to last, but, you know, just at this point, that's working. So John is doing all these, like, tidying up tasks very rationally and then he goes and takes his pill and sits in the driver's seat of the car and dies there. In the movie, he gasses himself in the car. I guess that's just as fitting. I don't know why he would choose carbon monoxide over the tablet. The tablet is a very easy method of euthanasia. Gassing yourself in your car like that, as a symbolism, it probably is the better move. But I don't know. I think taking the tablet and just dying quietly in the driver's seat, that would have been sufficient. Yeah, everything else is the same. Dwight and his men go out to see. The book doesn't have quite as many as the movie does. He gave them the choice to stay with their new families if they had them or to come out. And he refuses to take Moira. She wants to come with him and he refuses because women don't go on boats and he's married. In the movie, that doesn't make sense if he has already slept with her because... That would suggest he's moving on from that. So I don't know why he won't take her. I guess other institutions still have a hold in his head. So that military rule about no women must be the reason why he's not taking her. Anyway, he goes off, scuttles the scorpion, and Moira drives down to the beach to watch him go and takes her tablet once he's out of sight. So all of that in the movie happens basically the same. I mean, that's the nuts and bolts of it. The movie does a great job. The actors do a great job of um, enacting their final minutes. Mary does a particularly good job here because she didn't believe until now. So the whole thing is a shock. It's a real shock to her that here we are at the end and it actually is still happening. They haven't woken up from this nightmare that she thought everybody else was just living in. So I don't have any more to say. It was a great ending. The movie did that fantastically. The human touches through this movie were excellent. The way the actors presented the characters was fantastic. I have been critical about the way they have written Julian and Moira in this movie, but I don't think that's got anything to do with the actors. The actors did a magnificent job. It's just that I didn't like the characters that they put in. And I don't see why they changed them from the characters that were in the book. I presume there's something they had in the back of their heads that made that make sense. And I'm not really a movie person, so I don't know. But looking at this movie as an end of the world scenario, as a World War Three scenario, it's a fantastic contribution to that genre. And I think for people who are into disaster scenarios, this is definitely one to watch. 
So next I will talk about On the Beach 2000, but that will be in another video. Thank you for watching. Thank you.